Good morning, everybody. I'm Wesley Leonard. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm an associate professor of Native American studies in the Ethnic Studies Department. And I have the fortune, a good fortune, of being the convener for the Reclamation and Native American Communities Faculty Commons Group. It's one of the co-sponsors of today's session hosted by CIS. Very excited you know, to be part of this session, the violence of power, and the, also the larger conference you know, celebrating the good work of graduate students at UCR, many of whom I know, but I was recognizing I don't get to hear them present very often. And so what an opportunity this is. I wanted to just start with a bit of housekeeping. Uh, one is that it seems that people are already muted. I ask that you could keep, uh, stay muted during the presentations. Note that the session is already being recorded. Uh, we'll sort of splice off the first part before the official start. Uh, you may use the chat for questions or comments. You can also use the raise hand feature uh, to ask questions during the discussion session, which we will have after the presentations. And we can sort of do that informally. Probably I will call on you or maybe one of the presenters uh, can call on you, you know, sort of as the conversation flows. We're going to hear, well, we have uh, three presentations uh, scheduled <coughs> today. First, we'll be hearing from Brianna Simmons from the Department of Anthropology. Next, we'll be hearing from Cynthia Martinez uh, from my department from Ethnic Studies. And finally, we'll always uh, maybe a bit of technical difficulty getting in right now, hoping to hear from Daniel Archuleta uh, from the History Department. In all of these cases, I think, you know, these scholars are probably best equipped to introduce themselves however they deem appropriate. And so I'm going to ask them to do so you know, rather than my trying to, to do it for them. Before we begin, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement instead of echoing, the, many of you were in the previous session where there was some discussion about land acknowledgements and what they really mean. And also the idea that even though we're meeting virtually, all of us are in physical spaces. And it's very important that we recognize those spaces and that we honor those spaces. Speaking now from, for UCR as a whole, in the spirit of indigenous scholars, Rupert and Jeanette Costo's founding relationship to the UCR campus, we would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kuya, Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting space is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. I'll further acknowledge, of course, that I'm not on the UCR campus at the moment due to the pandemic, coming, you to, uh, coming to you, you know, from my living room which is uh, specifically in the lands of Kuya and Tongva peoples. And so I'd like to share my appreciation to them. Without further ado then, I think, uh, Brianna, we are ready to sort of transition into your presentation. So I'm going to pin your video. Hello, thank you for giving me your time to attend. As a descendant of the Middle Passage and in trade in African flesh, I'm meeting, um, learning and speaking with you all within Turtle Island from uh, Kuya Tongva Serrano Vicenio Homes, seven minutes from the settler academic plantation we call UC Riverside. So today I'll be sharing how I came to this research topic, my ongoing process, of designing this project, a brief framework, and my current meditations. And given that this is a snapshot yet to be deepened, I invite you all in our space to respond to questions, uh, to share with me your curiosities, your critiques, support, and inspirations. <clears throat> Generationally, birth and motherhood have been complicated, precarious, death kissing, joy expanding transformations for my ancestors, often with deep sacrifices. Um, this, the impetus for this project came from a, 
personal and witnessed experiences of grieving out of time, a kind of paradox that has grounded how I understand my position as a Black woman. Um, and so choosing to center Kenyan women's birth and improvisational survival practices came from convictions and invitations during a three-week 2019 summer stay in Kisumu, which the first pictures nod to, um, and not necessarily a desire to be in conversation with anthropology capital A's um, and global health narratives of health and maternal child health in Africa. Um, so in this, in June of 2019, I had the opportunity to assist with a qualitative social network study in Eldoret, which is the rightmost picture we were presenting in this um, hospital. And this, in my first week, I met Dina, who was a relative of the host family who took me in. And like many, she assumed I was Kenyan or perhaps Somalian. And I had to tell her that I wasn't. And we would continue to talk while cooking and cleaning. And on my sixth night, she asked me what it meant to be Black. And so sitting with how I was to collapse a lifetime of experiences into a few sentences, I shared with her that I understood I was Black and the many ways I could threaten and upset before I enjoyed any part of my childhood. And after a few more stories, she, about my family's experiences with healthcare in the Caribbean and the US, she told me about her father's recent recovery and described uh, being afraid to ever get sick because of how corrupt the political leadership and healthcare system were. And she kept repeating that the health insurance is a scam. And on her limited visits to her dad, she remembered this young boy, 15 year old boy who shared his side of the room. And now her dad fully recovered in a year, had his bills paid off, but she kept visiting this young boy who never left the hospital until he was 17 and a half due to pending paying treatment and the lodging while he was staying in the hospital. By the time he had left, his family lost their land, livestock, and 70% of their income. And in my second week presenting at this hospital on the right here in Eldoret for this workshop, I was standing in the middle of the parking lot struggling to process what I learned about the babies, mothers, and children who grew up and lived detained in these hospitals. It was the first time that I'd gained language to actually talk about what I'd witnessed in the Caribbean. And while I was walking through the hospital wards in Eldoret, um, among those willing to let me sit in their vulnerability were really taken by my rage and questions. And they asked me to return to help build awareness and to build something new. One thing that they said, and it sits with me, is we all know it is happening and we hope we never get sick. You might never get out, but what can you do? This is Kenya. We just know it is happening. We don't talk about it. So with an ethical distance, I'm still learning, but, and I am grieving that too, but invited, um, here is what I'm trying to do. Uh, so while you skim my abstract, um, I, wanted to, to frame the way that I think about healthcare is politics by other means. <clears throat> and I've included a fractal as a kind of visual for how I understand anti-Blackness as a particular kind of fractalizing ontology. Um, so when I say that I'm contributing with interrogative and collaborative investments, I mean that I'm speaking as a witness. Um, at this juncture of training and research, I suggest that a non-USian framework of anti-Blackness is a critical supplement to the growing mosaic of lived anti-Blackness around the world. So to posit this another way, I'm thinking that anti-Blackness is a fractalizing ontology with different kinds of permutations uh, in local context as, as how it's manifesting. And this ontology vascularizes imperial financial alliances and in the context of Kenya, I can only describe it right now as an imperial triad uh, with the US and the UK through the IMF and the World Health Organization and with, Ken uh, with China that's currently gripping Kenya and its material in young mothers' experiences with the healthcare system. Um, so moving forward, I'd like to give some context and scales to, so that we're able to have a conversation. So I included the quote at the top left um, as an invitation to meditate on the register and struggle for Black and Blackened people. And when I use the term Blackened, I'm trying to describe a position rendered by a signaled Blackness. So as a conceptual compass, my main research question, which I include um, at the right, moves through these three broad kinds of categories. So I'm extending um, Walter Rodney's 
framework of underdevelopment to nod as a starting point that while Kenya's history does not begin with colonization, the indigenous the shift to indigenous Kenyan political leadership in 1963 or the year of transition to independence is significant because it upheld um, the erected network of colonial disciplinary structures um, and fortified anti-black patriarchal mechanisms of exclusion, surveillance, and dispossession. So the discourse of underdevelopment gives a vocabulary and a generational geopolitical framework for the structural, gendered, and material implications concentrated in Kisumu Nyanza province, which are both the site of the hospital of interest for this project, as well as the picture on the left, Lumumba Hospital, which is the first hospital I started learning about healthcare in Kenya. To speak in Christina Sharp's vocabularies, both are sites of wake. So the Kenyan healthcare system, I'm understanding it as a class-based system that moves through different kinds of tiers and resources. Um, this graph on the left here summarizes maternal realities, which you know, to enter and survive motherhood through stages of the birthing process require a dangerous set of negotiations in the US, the Caribbean, and Africa. But in the context of Kenya with hospital care, maternal child health is complicated by the structural absence of obstetric supplies by medical and alternative providers, systemic exploitation through billing insurance and patient mistreatment, which in some cases includes neglect and abuse. But when recorded and studied, it gets cataloged as these kinds of um, representative portions of the um, graph here. And our rarely talked about unless they are in journalistic practices. So returning to my last framework to give skills, I tried to distinguish between care and services to bring attention to the nature and absorbed implications of institutional healthcare practices. So I'm examining the relationship among citizen granted insurance as the terms for access or mechanism of access to services anti-blackness and this imperial triad to demonstrate through the political history of Jajimoji, which is the hospital of focus, uh, and Nyanza province as a wider geography, that healthcare is about the institutional translation and operation of a specific political culture and ethos that functions as an architectural code to structure positionalities and has no investment in sustaining black life. So at the scale of theory, my framework can be grouped into these three categories. And I can be more specific about what I mean by each of these in a discussion period. But at this juncture, I understand, or I believe that the Kenyan healthcare network is a carceral system that deploys insurance and body detention as genocidal mechanisms, as part of the systemic investment in the propertization and dispossession of people who become patients. People need autonomous care to attend to each other while working to abolish property, which is why I try to make this distinction between what care and services are, because I understand services for Black people as entrapment um, and care is a necessary practice of refusal and escape. So I think about care through marriage. Um, centering Kenyan women's health care, and I'll put quotes there if it is really care, experiences make specific how and where the naturalizing and reproductive positions and instruments of anti-Blackness anchor themselves, which are important for me in thinking about the scale and dimensions of anti-Blackness, which is why I refer to anti-Blackness as a fractalizing ontology. My motivation here is hopeful and ambitious, but it's to offer a multi-coordinated intervention among pub public health and global health investments in human rights defenses, um, law centering social justice organizations advocating for additional policy and the anthropological inquiries of structural vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis the state and cultural history. And again, I can expand on these uh, in a discussion period. All of this theory that I'm using here, um, which this just gives an overview of, there's much more contributing to these kinds of conversations and many more that have invited me, but it's qualified by returning to the source, meaning the people. So training in the imperial core, um, humility is an important method and it requires that I remember my role as at best auxiliary. And while theory capital T is qualified by the people, it's also a space of struggle where I can engage with the paradox of my embodied position of blackness, the nature I and many other communities individually and collectively 
transoceanically are struggling against. So by returning to the source, um, I arrived at diaspora as method, which contrasted with geography a bit, in my opinion, uh, to reorient towards the subconscious logics that are programming our common vocabularies for exclusion by focusing on antagonistic positions and the conditions of possibility for those positions. Um, while geography is useful in thinking about why does something happen, where it's happening, uh, diaspora adds important dimensions that require a centering of anti-Blackness, which is a discussion that needs to happen. Uh, this unboundedness as methods for me generates a critique of disciplines and creates new ways to name and disrupt the unspoken requirements for why Black positioned people magnetize early and preventable death. Um, taken together, what I hope is building an axiological framework that's typically flattened by historical narrative. Um, I hope to analyze these relationships of power and contribute to kind of cognitive mapping for the lifeblood of gratuitous violence, its sources and implications. And to me, that kind of ideological attentiveness is practicing, is an aspect of refusal that practices care for thought. Um, and if I were to put that in other words, I'm encouraging disciplinary disobedience through epistemic insurrection because we need a new way to communicate, relate, and feel encouraged and invited to imagine. So all of these methods that I think about is who is invited by my call and how was I invited into this work as well. <clears throat> so to move to the methods, this just distills um, how I came here in the context of a graduate study and where I may be going. So it began with that three week summer stay in Kenya and has continued since my departure by continuing to build those relationships with families, research assistants, providers, and researchers. Um, in my current period, I'm preparing for a digital phase of ethnography to tailor how it is I can continue to ask these questions um, and make more specific how it is I attend to vulnerability and protection. Um, both ethically and materially, especially as we prepare for this post-pandemic world, whatever that is, isn't, and can look like. So taken together, my phases include a mixed method approach, which also requires new ways of answering these kinds of questions, because in many ways, um, my discipline does not prepare me for them. So these are, so I've listed some of the things that I'm thinking about. Both are important in terms of how community is built in Kenya, and some are their more um, canonical or traditional methods. Uh, so exiting the conversation, it's no longer a question of knowing the world, right? We know that description isn't liberation, but we're trying to transform it. So I try to juxtapose this with a video uh, from taken from my time when I was in Kenya. I was in a national park and I was leaving. Um, so in my dedication to study, I know that description isn't liberation, but as a witness, I know that the practice and language created also transformed, which is part of the focus. So one of the questions I'm sitting with is, what in this moment constitutes property? For whom it is, is it a solution and for whom is it a problem? And why is it a problem for Black and Black and people? And while I see the product of abolishing property connected to a mobilization to abolish police and policing, we are necessarily um, supposed to also create community care and love, which are also done in these intimate and close spaces. But as principles of freedom, I have to think about how do I do this in the context of research, considering that I chose to deepen relationships in this way. Um, but exiting, I'd like to echo witnesses, ancestors, creators, and revolutionaries before me. Um, nothing need be this way. Everything that is worthwhile is done with other people. You are my witness. Shauri Yamangu, this is Kenya. Peace to you if you're willing to fight for it. Aluta Kentinua. Thank you for listening. Asinteni. Mishinewa, Brianna, that was a wonderful, so interesting. I have so many questions. Uh, and comments. Of course, I realized at the beginning of the session, I said, we will take those questions and comments at the end. And so perhaps I see some people are, are using the clap function. You can sort of join me in um, 
acknowledging the importance of Brianna's work. And definitely sort of keep those questions and comments in mind. And so uh, I'd like to sort of, you know, go ahead and move directly into uh, Cynthia Martinez's presentation. Okay, let me get started, set it up here. Um, can folks see my presentation good? Yes, yes. Let me see. I don't know if it's presentation mode. There you go. Um, well, hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here and joining us. Uh, my name is Cynthia Martinez. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Ethnic Studies. The title of this presentation is Sexual Violence and the Unmaking of the Human Through Reform. So just to start off, I want to introduce um, the topic of my research and my dissertation. My dissertation, um, the broader dissertation is based on my years of organizing and activism in the community through deportation defense at the Adelanto ICE Detention Center here in San Bernardino County. Um, I have been volunteering for three years or doing a type of activism which we call deportation defense. And what deportation defense consists of is we folks in the community who have been criminalized, who are undocumented or children of undocumented people, we organize to support folks, migrants inside ICE detention to fight for their liberation. Uh, we do this through providing um, resources to, to pro bono attorneys, um, to helping them with the, um, the credible fear interview. We do this through also giving some um, emotional care and just being there for folks and also providing visitations um, and writing letters. So my broader research is based on my years of activism and things I have done um, and visitations and the people I have met here. Uh, for folks who are not very familiar with the Adelanto ICE Detention Center, it is two hours away from LA and it's also one hour away from UC Riverside. As of 2021, in January, the Adelanto Detention Center is now the biggest detention center in the US and the United States is the country that detains the most immigrants in the world. Um, so the Adelanto <laughs> Detention Center is a place where I, I, I identified as not a exceptional place to study migrant detention, but instead it's a symptomatic um, place to, to study migrant detention and specifically sexual violence. Um, along with Adelanto being the biggest detention center now with 2,640 beds, um, Adelanto also ranked third highest um, in sexual assault allegations in 2017. Uh, this is the most updated information we have on sexual assault allegations. Uh, but there is a high number of reports and testimonies of sexual assault occurring in the Adelanto ICE Detention Center. My, my dissertation, the, the beginning of it, the first chapter talks about the conditions of possibility in the San Bernardino County that gave rise to the Adelanto Detention Center, um, and specifically the conditions of possibility and settler, settler law logics that um, produce San Bernardino County as the modern day um, ICE prison town, which that's why I, that's what I identify it as. But today I want to focus more on talking about the sexual assault allegations um, and kind of dive into that, why sexual assault is occurring in ICE detention centers um, and how we can move forward and build a movement to reduce these things that are happening. Um, so just to let you all know, uh, I am going to be talking about some heavy topics here. So this is a trigger warning. If folks need to take some space, go ahead. Um, I will be talking about rape, sexual assault, and sexual abuse. So I want to start off briefly by looking some um, at some quick numbers generated from the data analysis I conducted from FOIA request. So I collected some FOIA requests from the organizations I have been working with um, and journalists and attorneys that I've also been in communication with. Uh, so the first chart here looks at the sexual assault allegations or sexual violence allegations from 2010 to 2016. Again, this is the most updated information we have as of now. And if we look here 
the agency of ICE within the DHS um, broader fields, ICE has the highest allegations than any other agency, higher than the California Border Patrol Agency as well, which to me was very shocking when I first learned this. Um, but part of my argument is that because ICE is both a place that um, where it, it's both a place that is carceral, right, in the way that it's a prison, but it's also a place where the border manifests. Um, and here is an expansion of the allegations within the, the Agency of Immigration Customs Enforcement, or also known as ICE. So if you look at the categories here, there are various of categories um, listed. This is again from 2010, 2016. The highest number of allegations are in this category that says detainee, prisoner, and sus suspect related abuse. Um, the second highest are detainee reported sexual abuse and sexual assault. I do have to give a note on the inconsistencies with the data. Um, I found that these categories don't have any definitions behind them. There's no classifications within DHS to give me any information what defines these categories. Sometimes in the, in the FOIA reports, there's, um, there's overlapping cases within the categories of allegations. And there's also been duplicate allegations, um, which other reports or other um, articles haven't really been able to flesh out these duplicate um, cases. So there is a lot of inconsistencies that I found when looking at the data that I've collected. Um, and that's also part of my argument here that I, I'm building with what does this mean? Uh, this is just another chart to show the previous slide. Um, but here I took out the, the biggest number, which was the deta detainee reported um, abuse. And here I just basically filter to all of the allegations pertaining to sexual violence, se sexual assault. And I want to pay attention specifically to the year of 2012, 2013, and 2014. So if we see starting at 2012, there is an increase of allegations. Um, and this is an important point here, and this is what I want to focus on here for, for my discussion, but also the chapter that I'm currently working on. The reason why those years are important is because from 2012 to 2014, we see a series of reforms passed. And again, this is a time period where people really embraced a very liberal era, right, with the Obama administration. Um, so we have these reforms that were passed with the, through the Obama administration, um, where there was a series of gender violence reforms, right, passed both nationally, but within the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and if we look back at the data, this is when the increase in allegations begin um, for specifically for detainee reported sexual abuse and sexual assault. So after these reforms, it, that's when detainee reported sexual abuse and sexual assault became its own category. So I ask, um, sorry, I have a question. Okay, I got distracted with the chat comment. Um, sorry, it was a direct question. Um, so I ask here um, for, my, for my chapter, how is it that at this juncture of feminist liberalism and the national human rights discourse, right, through the Obama era, this moment of liberal progress, um, which is employed through, through these reforms, how is it that we see an increase of sexual violence in ICE detention centers? So rather than focusing on um, the carnage and the abuse, as I initially was when I started this chapter, um, I decided to focus on why is this still occurring? Why is sexual violence still prevalent despite reforms that have been passed? To find this answer, I read the data provided by DHS and the reforms as carceral archives. So I build off Lisa Lowe who states, um, I don't read these colonial archives, archives as stable, transparent, or collection of facts. Um, so instead, I also utilize reading a reading against the grain methodology to situate these statistics and data as a thread of carceral archives that do not demonstrate facts, but instead are part of state archives that sustain carcerality. And by carcerality, I mean both prison and borders. So I'm not reading this data as actual facts. I'm actually reading them as um, carceral state archives. 
So these numerous reports and reforms, statistics on sexual violence actually tell us more um, with the anxieties of DHS as an agency and the state rather than relaying information um, to the public for accountability. And this is a quote by Ann Stoller, which I think it's important to mention in its um, full context, because this is how I'm building my um, idea of carceral state archives. So Ann Stoller looks at colonial archives and she talks about colonial archives being as a material bureaucracy of rule and the historical trace of imperial activities. The colonial archive portrays colonial governance as strategic, permeable and improvisational process. It's a, the tireless collection of tables, statistics, measurements and numbers and the unending volumes of records and reports the copied and recopied correspondence between offices, the production of legal classifications, cases, and typologies. These actively document, um, actively document and produce the risk, problems, and uncertainties that were the conditions of imperial rule. So I like this quote because that is exactly what I found when looking at the data, the statistics, the reports, the FOIA, and also um, the the reforms that were passed within DHS and nationally. It was just a, a large number of statistics and data to show that sexual violence is manageable, right? That it's that the state has a strategy. So you're right, um, neoliberal feminism. Um, I argue that the state archive, which is housed in the Department of Homeland Security, is tasked to secure the state in two major ways. So first, the Homeland Security state, right, it secures itself through by or through a perceived crisis of racialized migrants, but it also has the job of securing itself as a benevolent modern liberal democracy. Um, so I position this current moment right now and after the passing of these reforms as a liberal feminist era after 2003, where humanist and feminist discourse is utilized to advance state power and violence. I, I build up the argument via the following theories, um, which is like Dylan Rodriguez, White Reconstruction, Jody Malamed's anti-racist liberal capitalist modernity, Lisa Lowe's modern humanism, and Sadia Hartman's humanist project during the Reconstruction era. Hartman specifically is important for me because she argues that during the Reconstruction era, former Black enslaved people were granted humanity to secure the longevity of violence and death. So rather than absolving anti-Black violence, humanity was granted for the continuance of violence. I read carceral archives and feminist neoliberalism under the same rubric because carcerality is an anti-Black project or the afterlife of slavery. Um, ICE detentions are carceral spaces, as I mentioned before, but they're also a place where the border manifests. So I argue that the carceral archives after 2010 have unmade the category of human to include detainees or incarcerated people precisely to enable their bodily disintegration and violation. So one example of this, um, oh, I'm so there's another part to that. Um, <laughs> I want to continue this. I read VAWA, so the Violence Against Women Act. This is part of the reforms that I listed. I read um, the Violence Against Women Act and the Prison Rape Elimination Act, PRIA, these reforms as a project of liberal feminism to transform the body of captive non-citizens or detainees um, in ICE detention as human. A condition that affirms their violation, yet it doesn't give them any rights. This process, rather than affirming life, further facilitate sexual violence and death. So an example of this is this language taken directly from um, SAPID, which is the sexual, um, I believe it's the sexual assault and abuse protocols. And they take their language from BAWA and PRIA. And they state, until recently, public viewed sexual abuse the public views sexual abuse as an inevitable future of confinement, even as courts and human rights standards increasingly confirm that prisoners have the same fundamental rights to safety, dignity, and justice as individuals living at liberty in the community, vulnerable men and women and children continue to be sexually victimized by other prisoners and correctional staffs. Tolerance of sexual abuse of prisoners in the government custody is totally incompatible, incompatible with American values. So this is a quote directly from these reforms in the Department of Homeland Security, um, specifically for ICE detention. 
So again, while this would seemingly seem like a progressive turn, um, I'm arguing that actually it's this liberal language that is enabling the violation, the further violation of people in ICE detention as demonstrated through the, through the statistics. Well, the state agency and the carceral archives repeated use of humanness. So I see this idea of humanness and human dignity over and over again in these um, reforms, right? So this idea of humanness and the liberal discourse needs to be dislodged. Um, Sylvia Winter, whose images here and other Black feminists actually have long challenged the category of human. For Black feminists, the category of human and humanity is a category that actually advances anti-Black anti -black violence. Right, right whoops, yeah, whoops, wait, wait. And death. Lisa Lowe also describes modern humanism itself as a European concept invested in notions of the free human who has achieved quote unquote political emancipation through citizenship in the state. Um, migrant rights as well, migrant rights spaces and the social sciences who talk about immigrant rights movement almost always resort to a human rights discourse to try to justify or to try to gain justice for, for migrants. So I, I want to move away from this lens of a human rights discourse and move towards this lodging the idea of humanity. So humanity needs to be destabilized because the term is invested in anti-Black violence. And it's also a term that centralizes, that is central to criminalizing discourses. Um, in her work, Leanne Wang talks about how this idea of um, humanity and reform actually is used in the U visas for immigrant women, right? So it's to, to provide protection for migrant women and sexual assault survivors. Um, what the US government has done is given protection under a U visa and citizenship to immigrant women. But in fact, what it does is it has them participate in the criminalizing process of other migrants. Um, to go back really quick, so I argue that this idea of human is not only invested in this idea of white free um, citizenship and agency, but also the idea of human is invested in this concept of consent. And consent is very central to neoliberal feminism and these feminist um, reforms. So briefly, I want to finish with this idea of the paradox of consent. Um, so this is a screenshot from the DHS policy on the standards to prevent sexual assault. Um, and I have highlight, highlighted here because in this reform, DHS states that, right, the definition of, of um, sexual abuse or assault is when any when a detainee who is by force or coercion or intimidation or if the victim did not consent or was unable to consent refuse or engage in attempts to engage in and, and then it lists these other um criteria right here but when it comes to a detainee by a staff member um sexual abuse or sexual uh assault dhs changes its language and it says it's either with consent or without consent it's considered sexual assault um, so here we see DHS adapt this idea that people who are detained or incarcerated cannot consent. Um, so there's this paradox because while the DHS accepts this, that people who are detained cannot accept, at the same time, VAWA and PRIA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, has not changed its definition of sexual abuse. And its definition of sexual abuse only applies to when times when the victim does not consent or is unable to consent. I'm going to skip over this real quick for time purposes. Um, here is that captain non-citizens have no rights, right? So people who are detained, who are immigrants and are non-citizens, which I call captain non-citizens, don't have any access to rights. Um, Kathleen Arnold argues that non-citizens have no legal rights under the US Constitution, including no legitimate access to habeas corpus. Um, non-citizens are inherently criminalized through illegality. Um, so the presence is categorized as illegal. So this process gives them no rights under the constitution. Um, and also they have no personhood. According to Lisa Marie Cacho, she identifies non-citizens as socially dead. And yet we see through VAWA and PRIA and these reforms in um, DHS 
that grant consent in the case of sexual assaults and also medical procedures under feminist, feminist liberal reforms. So the question is why? Um, the, the majority of, I should mention this, so the majority of cases and allegations go, on, they're, they're not investigated, only less than 1% are turned into investigations. That's another part of the data analysis. So less than 1% of the allegations are actually turned into investigations which within DHS, and most of them are found, found unsubstantiated. Um, the reason for this, when I looked at the procedures by DHS is because they're unable to to claim or to establish whether consent was given by the detainee or not. So I'm arguing that in this case, when it comes to sexual assault, it's when we see this idea of consent and agency, which is rooted in humanity. Whereas migrants who are non-citizens and captive at the same time are not given rights in any other case. So that is precisely to legitimize and to not prosecute the, the sexual violence that has been occurring. I would like to end um, with this slide towards abolition. So what is my argument or what's the point of this, right? If people are saying, hey, Cynthia, like you don't believe in consent, <laughs> right? Um, then wh what do we do with people who are detained? Um, overall, my argument is that carcerality and ICE detention centers can never be, be made safe or be made nonviolent. In the beginning of my presentation and throughout my presentation, I also had an image of a poster um, that said report sexual assault. Um, that poster I took when I visited one of the detention centers or Adelanto detention center. Um, and it has information about reporting sexual assault and it claims to be, to have accountability and that the state takes a stand towards zero tolerance, right? There's zero tolerance policy. However, I argue that detention can never be made safe. Um, the main point of this presentation and my dissertation is that ICE detention or the logics of carcerality and prison and bordering are always fundamentally sexually violent. They will always be sexually violent. Um, therefore, scholars in immigration studies and migrant detention, we must undertake an abolitionist approach that moves beyond these reforms. And, these reforms that always reproduce anti-Black violence and violence onto brown bodies. Um, we must also become vigilant how liberal feminism is adapted by the state precisely to, adapt, um, to advance violence, right? So the state does this through its carceral archives. It's by the data and statistics, the reforms and the, and the reports that the violence gets obscured and gets repackaged as a liberal, liberal progress. And finally, we must find other ways to theorize justice other than human rights. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. I'm sure that there are lots of questions. I was watching at least the people who had their videos on and I was sort of seeing these questions and comments coming forth. But uh, for the sake of time, I do want to move into our third present presenter, Daniel Archuleta. And then as noted, uh, after Danny presents, we will have some time for, for Q&A and commentary for the panel as a whole. So Danny, whenever you're ready. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. We're logged in twice. Hmm. Can I try it again, please? Okay, I got it. Thank you. All right, so. Good day, everyone. Banchuri Jig, Daniel Archuleta, Ani Awu Atom. So, my name's Danny, uh, and I'm Atom. Uh, Tohono Atom, so that's the people we'll be covering today, and Drunken and Dizzy, um, which means the desert people. Um, so, I have some keywords here just real quick as we go through, so I have to keep explaining, but you might see the word Pima, which is what the Spaniards used to call the Akamal Atom, which are the river people. Uh, Pabago is what they used to call the Tohono Atom, 
uh, desert people. Him thog is just like uh, the Autumn culture or path or way of being. Nawat is a form of wine made from the Cigarro um, cactus, um, specifically from the Bahidaj, which is the fruit that grows off. Um, and then Chechfa Awi, uh, that will become more important later, but it means the Pleiades constellation in our language in Autumn. Um, so I just want to kind of frame the presentation with this quote from Quo Lee Driscoll. Uh, oppression is used by the settlers to tame our wild and savage understandings of ourselves, to injure our traditional understandings of the world, to pit us against each other, so that the powers that be have less work to do in maintaining control over our homelands, our bodies, and our spirits. Um, and hopefully it will become clear why I use that quote, but this is just a map of the Tohono O'odham Reservation. Um, here, Cells is kind of like the capital of it. Um, used to be called Indian Oasis. And then there's the San Xavier, the smaller reservation on the right. Um, so in the beginning, right, um, how it all started for me, uh, where all exciting stories start in the archives. Uh, the National Archives at Riverside. Um, I don't think this is a picture of the National Archives, but that's how I imagine myself as when I'm doing research. But it's nothing like that. I'm just in a tiny room, and there's a guy staring at me like I'm going to steal stuff. But I go through the folders, right? and um, in the, for the Ton Autumn, and I'm doing my research, and it's just like like I come a lot of Law and Order, Seduction and Bastardy folders, and I'm like, you know, what is going on here, right? Um, and inside of all these folders, the Law and Order folders, there's not a lot of real crime, at least what you would consider crime. It's mostly like sex and adultery charges, um, trying to arrest somebody for getting somebody pregnant, um, cheating. You know, an Indian was drinking and they were drunk, they got arrested, um, and that's basically what I was seeing. And there's not really like crime, like murder and stuff like that. Um, takes me to the special officer, Henry Larson, who this is like a letter I had found in there, but it's basically just this officer named Jameson who's reporting to his superior. And all he's doing is driving around village to village and he's sniffing ollas, which are these little clay pots that you see pictured. And he's just, if they smell like alcohol, he's just smashing them. And he's like really proud of himself for doing this. And that seems to be all he's doing, which leads me to thinking about um, Ignaz Pfefferkorn, who is a Jesuit priest 1755, um, he learns about this autumn ceremony in the desert. Um, so, you know, the Indians are drinking, having a great time. Um, and he rides his horse through the middle of it and just starts breaking the Oyas again, right? So it's kind of like history repeating itself. Um, it's, but this is like 162 years prior to uh, the United States doing the same exact thing. Um, and of course, all the Indians were whipped at the end because that's what they did, um, which gets me too drunken and dizzy, kind of the, the title. Um, and I was thinking, like, it kind of, when I was going through all this, it led me to think, like, why is there all this focus on alcohol and drugs and sex in the archive? Um, and, you know, with the Spaniards, too, that was also an obsession with them as well. Um, and it might be obvious, some of the reasons, but I was also interested in what connects these things, not just for, like, the settlers, but for the awesome people. Like, what are the connecting um, tissue there? Um, so I started, it led me to this idea of dizziness. Uh, what we call nota gig, which literally means to bid dizzy causing. Um, but it's important, like the beginning of that word not means to turn, bend, or return. Um, turn, bend, return. So I started theorizing like, you know, this is like a journey, right? A circular journey. Um, you turn, bend consciousness, and then you return to your normal state. Um, and I've kind of been finding out that through sex and drugs and ceremony, the awesome access is dizzy state in order to experience a world invisible to the eye. Through certain ceremonies where sex and drugs were intersected, they achieved this dizzy state. Um, so I argue that a lot of the these these settler institutions, like alcohol prohibition, mandating Western marriage, the targeting and the training of often women by field matrons, is part of a more nefarious plot to sever indigenous bodies from their concepts of personhood, which is tied to the land and the spirit. Because Nota Gig is an essential state needed to access the spirit realm, um, I've been like kind of rethinking. Uh, of how we perceive drinking and drunkenness, I guess, um, and how this leads to cycles of violence, imprisonment, shame, guilt, and these are all kind of tactics to keep the awesome policing themselves through these invisible shackles of imposed morality. And so leads to kind of the anthropologist part of this. Um, so I'll just kind of briefly go into, that's Ruth under here on the right, bottom right, and Maria Chona uh, under here, you know, spend a lot of time on the Tonawatham Reservation and writing about them. And 
she I took the, the title from her, I guess, um, because she said that drunken and dizzy are sacred and poetic words in the awesome language for the trance of drunkenness is akin to the trance of vision. Um, and she says that there, um, there's certain ceremonies where participants are encouraged to get beautifully drunk. Um, she also talked about um, wandering women um, and these wandering women would kind of go around and have sexual partners. Um, and but she said this is a very important um, part and these women were celebrated, there's songs about them. Um, so now, you know, connecting the sex, the alcohol to the ceremonies um, with that, which leads to the creation of the Pleiades, um, which is a old story and this is collected in 1973 and I'll just summarize it real quick. But the idea was that they often were given this particular ceremony, uh, but they're a group of women, that's all they wanted to do. So they just wanted to sing, they wanted to dance, they just wanted to do the ceremony all the time. Um, you know, obviously that affected their lives, um, their responsibility to their families and their communities. So they have to go to a powerful medicine woman in the story. And the medicine woman says, you know, I will, I will help you out, but I'm gonna make an example of you. So she sprinkles them with water, they turn to stone, she throws them in the sky, they become the Pleiades. Um, and the idea is to kind of be an example of what happens when you don't, when you fail to kind of meet your responsibilities to your community. At least that's what I would argue. Some people would say it's, it's a, a story about, you know, sleeping around or partying. Uh, but I think it's not about that. It's not admonish, admonishing women for being sexual. It's about um, when you do that to excess, I guess, is what I would say, or how I interpret the story. Um, which leads us to Donald Barr and David Kolek, two more um, anthropologists. Um, Barr writes about horror sickness, um, and I can't get into like the whole complex kind of theory of sickness that the Optum has, but um, he writes about this stain sickness of the book you see there. Um, but he wrote about this sickness, and it's basically men or women can get it, succumbing to temptation and dreams. Barr gave these spiritual women um, the title Women of Darkness. And then he translated the uh, the word uh, Awi, which I mentioned earlier, into whores, which it literally means the Pleiades constellation or wandering women. But so now you can kind of see how the things are getting conflated because these seem to be the same women that Underhill had previously wrote about and called them the women of light. Um, so now there's some confusion here. Um, Kozak is also writing about dizziness. He writes about um, a story that was told to him by an Optum about his sister, Daisy. And again, just to summarize, um, a trickster kind of comes to her, uh, it's a black snake, but he comes to her as a handsome man, he kind of seduces her at night. Um, but what's important about the story is that every time the trickster would come to her, she would get into that dizzy state. She would say, I'm feeling dizzy, he's coming, right? <laughs> and then, you know, it would happen. So also trying to think of this like as a doorway too, right? So like it's a journey, a doorway, this kind of, it's a very complex uh, mental state. Um, he also writes about, um, in his other article, Echoes of Mythical Creation, about, no, I'm sorry, the other one, Swallow Song, um, Dizziness and the Laughter at Carnival. Um, and basically what he does is he he, he compares notegeg or dizziness to the laughter at Carnival, European Carnival. Um, so I don't know if that holds up too well, but um, he, because he says that these songs are about drinking and dizziness because of the way swallows, they fly, right? They look kind of drunk, kind of dizzy. Um, so he says that this is scandalous and reprehensible. He's quoting some often women there who are often moralists. He doesn't identify who they are. They could be Catholic. I don't know. But um, someone thought it was okay to, you know, do this dance in the ceremony. And on the right, you can kind of see um, some aspects of that. And on the left is the European carnival. Um, and as you can see on the right, that is kind of like what the dance would be like. And it's about rain, essentially. And all awesome kind of dances and ceremonies, whether they are communal or private, have to do with rain and the bringing of rain and fertility, which is very important if you imagine living in the desert. Um, and Texas back to, why is this all important? <laughs> 1916, back to the map. Um, so, I'm sorry, my notes are kind of messed up. But. Um, so back to the map. Okay, the map is not only just a picture of our homeland, uh, but it's a visual representation of the government administrators exerting their power to police Indian bodies. Because, as I said, San Xavier Reservation was created in 1874, uh, but this bigger uh, reservation was not created till 1916. And the reason for that was because the headquarters was at San Xavier, 
but most of the Indians often lived in this large kind of desert region to the west. And it was explicitly said, we want to stop them from drinking and having sex. So they created this reservation in order to police Indian bodies. Like that's pretty much um, how it happened. Um, you know, there were a lot of Optum that were advocating to get this created too. So I don't want to minimize their involvement in, in that happening. But Cato Cells is kind of the man behind it. And that's why it's named Cells Arizona after Cato Cells, who was uh, very anti-whiskey um, for the Indians. And again, 1916, creation of the Optum, Ton Optum Reservation, immediately alcohol prohibition, the boarding in religious schools, the Presbyterians and Catholics were kind of fighting for the souls of the Optum. They introduced the field matrons, uh, the superintendent mandates that Optum uh, men and women be married according to Arizona law. And again, the only reason for that was because they wanted to prosecute people who were committing adultery. Uh, and there's a famous case in 1916 where a man committed adultery and they could not prosecute him because they were not legally married. Um, so that's the only reason behind that. Um, and let's see. Yeah, so we can move on. Um, so it takes us back to Coley Driscoll and kind of what I've been thinking about is this idea of the sovereign erotic. So sovereign erotic is a return to and or continuance of the complex realities of gender and sexuality that are ever present in the, both the human and the more than human world, but erased and hidden by colonial cultures. So I've been thinking about this Notegeg or this, this, this state, right, as a vehicle towards this sovereign erotic, which for me is a continuance of the complex realities of gender and sexuality, right? Um, that, you know, this could be harmful state, right, if not taken seriously. Um, and they're ever present in the human and more than human world. It's kind of shown with the trickster character and this kind of doorway and this to the to um, to the human world. Um, and it's been erased and hidden by colonial cultures. Um, and I would also say probably stigmatized by colonial cultures. Um, so, like in conclusion, uh, I think a return to a ton of erotic is to embrace the ecstatic, the intoxicating dizziness of song, dance, and lovemaking among the cigarro, tasting each other's lips, sweet from sweet and sticky from the Nawa, nota gig. Therefore, a Tahana Optum erotic recognizes our animal relatives' agency and what they teach us about desire, obsession, and selfishness. An Optum erotic looks towards the stars and what they can teach us about balance and recognizes the fire, strength, and mystery of the universe that lives inside every woman. Thank you. And then I have references that I think you really get to talk about. But. Mishinewe, Danny, there's so many sort of interesting things. And so I see some others are can join me in the, the clapping. I'm going to do it but in person because I have my, my camera on. You know, with all three presentations, I was thinking about how much I appreciate how you're, you're critiquing norms. And Brianna, you were really exploring the notion of anthropology versus anthropology, theory versus theory, and with your references to the capital A and to the capital T, and ways in which one can draw from those ideas, but then also disrupt them uh, in productive ways. Cynthia, you made me think a lot about human rights. Uh, the world of indigenous languages, you know, human rights is considered the progressive way to talk about languages, as opposed to sort of saving languages or recording languages so that we, we being colonizers can study them and can extract from them. Instead, as the argument goes, let's adopt a discourse of human rights. But I think you've you know, raised a number of important issues there. And Danny, I was struck by so many things that you said, especially the, you know, idea that I think was also drawing from the other, you know, presentations or sort of in line, I should say, with the other presentations about this reservation being created to police bodies on the various ways in which Indigenous studies is sort of constantly responding to that and our sort of reclamation, which is the theme of the, of the faculty commons group that I convene, is about disrupting those sorts of things saying, no, no, these ideas, whatever they are, whatever is considered good or bad or whatnot, you know, needs to come from the indigenous communities themselves, not from you know, somebody else uh, policing, policing us. 
but so that I don't take all of the time, we have about 15 minutes now. And so I see that there have already been a couple of questions, uh, some perhaps uh, directly, uh, some open you know, to all in the chat. And I see uh, Kwatemok uh, has their hand raised. And so while the presenters are looking in the chat, uh, Kwatemok, uh, could we have he, uh, you sort of state your question or comment? Yeah, um, my question is for uh, Daniel. First of all, thank you for your work um, and your passion. I was wondering about, and I'm thinking about um, uh, human rights, um, the limits of, of sovereign erotics or ero erotics, uh, what have you found are the limits of, of engaging in those practices and those essentially re indigenization and how does oppression persist? And what are other um, ways of resistance that you have found? Uh, you did. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and I don't know if I've thought about all of those things yet. Um, I'm still, this is kind of like the early stages of this, but that's, that's a lot to really think about. Of course, this is a call to the two of you, Patemok and Dan, Danny, to, you know, to continue this conversation. That's one of the really important things about conferences, to sort of get people in conversation with each other. I often find out that they're thinking about similar sorts of things that may not you know, already be in conversation, especially uh, during this period of remote engagement. Yeah, I would love to keep talking about that because there's some, there's aspects of this that I haven't even thought about, like I said, so thank you. So Maria, I see that you've um, you put a comment uh, into the chat and you had also sort of commented earlier, so I think drawing on the work of, of Sylvia Winter, uh, do you have a sort of a question that you would like to? I can respond to Maria's question. Thank you for asking that. And also okay. thank you for the question you left me with in the course I took with you. You pushed me to think deeper about ontology. And I think part of that relates to the question you asked me, which I'll try and paraphrase it, um, to think about the other modalities of engaging with the materiality of experience and you reference Winter's decipherment. And are there ways to engage in observation, analysis, theorization that I may be using in my research? And I appreciate this question because it builds on how I understand ontology. So I'll try and be concise, but this might be kind of a long answer. How much time do we have? Well, I was planning to be here all day, but I think in terms of this session, <laughs> uh, we have about 12 minutes. That's another okay. portion of that, and then we'll try to take a couple more questions. All right. Um, all right, so when I think about ontological framework, which is part of how I arrive at anti-Blackness, I'm talking about um, a living, expanded, deepened set of political and social vocabularies that intersect at narrative, discourse, and performance in embodied and planetary contexts that give rise to significant forms of self-identification that are edified by institution. So then ontology is a contemporary set of languages, both in political structure and position, um, that gives us categories and language for forms of identification and exclusion as an architectural code for individual and collective positionalities that we detailed by it through intersectionality, our current social structures, um, you know, and so on. So for me, anti-Blackness is necessarily a problem of form because as, as a position and a set of experiences, I see it as a process of becoming. Um, so it, to me, I pull, I would, I would echo Jackson, Zikia Jackson's framework that it is a formless form that gives what the human is, right? In my metacritical approach to anti-Blackness and ontology, I'm not as much focusing on what it means to be human as what the human is. And for me, that requires a discussion on position. And in the context of blackness, there is an unboundedness. There is a, it, we are a formless form. So on a, I have trouble thinking or speaking to a set of terms 
from materiality because to me that assumes a kind of container. So I would think with unboundedness and figure out um, what are the politics of transfiguration necessary to speak to experience and different ways of creating that, something that might be more ephemeral or something that is, as I mentioned in our class, like pluriversal, so ways of talking and narrating experience or illustrating experience in art. Um, and part of this, I'm gonna nod to a question that Dr. Nita asked me about. The, well, he asked me a lot, but one of them was asking me to speak on the difference between speaking as a witness versus an ethnographer. So an ethnographer doubts what they see and sticks to a set of methods to fix an object of study. Um, whereas a witness, I think I'm more encouraged to um, not so much apprehend through sensibility and create this kind of archive based on my judgment, but I would encourage reckoning, I would encourage unboundedness, I would encourage different kinds of refusal and participation. And going back to my framework, thinking about care as marinage, I think about cornrows, I think, which, you know, like that was a practice of refusal as a, a different way of mapping escape, which I don't know if people know that his, that's part of a history of cornrows as well. Um, so I'm trying, you know, I think Winter says that she wants, they want us to make meaning decipherable and purposes alterable. So I don't have an answer to it yet because this is where I'm, I'm at right now. Um, I'm thinking about transfiguration and, you know, blackness is the template in like a semantic field for gender in many ways. So I think very deeply about the problem of form and it's part of why I'm trying to understand what is the relationship with blackness and property because I see it. Blackness is a kind of ontological currency that gives a language for form and thingification, part of which we take up with this concept of land and property. So I don't really have a set answer, but those are some of the things your question makes me think about. I don't know if that's confusing. I could continue, but I'll yield time to the other attendees and panelists. Thank you, Maria. And thank you, Brianna, for sharing those thoughts. And you know, I, I thought your you know comments were were good and sort of raised more questions. And that's sort of a, a hallmark of, of good comments. They raise more questions, but those other questions are better. They're more refined. And so yeah, we do have time for additional questions or comments. Again, you're uh, welcome to put uh, comments or questions into the chat, uh, or to use the raise hand feature. For that matter, I think there are few few enough people that uh, probably would be okay to just unmute and to ask your question. I do see a sort of a question for Daniel from uh, Keith Miyake. I'm going to uh, read this uh, aloud so that it'll make it into the recording. He was wondering uh, if you could speak about the role of the United States-Mexico border in policing and resistance within the broader Autumn nation. And everybody else, you'll all recall, of course, that this is a nation that's where the border got imposed later. And we saw the reservation map in Danny's presentation, as well as the borders that are right, right there. Danny? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to mention that, yeah. Our our land is like cut in half basically went into southern uh, mexico and yeah there's a lot going on i mean the border issue that's a whole nother because <laughs> um, yeah there's this whole other kind of policing of indian bodies that they put up these ifts or i forgot what they're called but they're towers that essentially monitor you 24 7. Um, they have cameras they have all these kind of high-tech stuff um and you know the reservation is constantly there constantly under surveillance and if you ever go there i mean it's just zigzagging back and forth with um, border patrol, you know, and they're just zoom, you know, zipping by and, and you know, you don't know why. There's a checkpoint to go in and out by the border patrol. Um, they've like run people over in the past and, you know, so yeah, there's a lot of violence kind of, and it, it kind of goes unseen, I think. And that goes more along with like people who study the border and how the, it's this kind of zone of exclusion or these things that happen there and it's just kind of allowed. And, um, and all these new technologies that are being tried out there like drones and stuff like that. Um, and then of course the border wall was another big issue that um, often people were all fighting against. Um, and now that seems to not happen, but 
I think both this goes back to that neoliberal thing too, but um, as Cynthia was talking about how the right and the left both want something there, right? The, the right want to build a giant wall, which destroys the cigarro cactus, which is very important to the often people. Um, and like I said, brings rain. Uh, and we consider them relatives um, and they're being you know, killed to build this wall. Um, but on the left, they want a, a digital wall or whatever they're calling it nowadays, which is essentially more IFTs, more drones, uh, more of this technology that will be used, you know, sooner or later to, to police everybody, you know, inside the country as well. And this, and it should mention too that a lot of these technologies and the IFTs are coming from Israel, from an Israeli company. Um, and one of their taglines on it, um, I think it was for the IFT, says um, "field tested on Palestinians." So it kind of gives you an idea of like the connection between um, settler colonialism around the world, I guess. I see a comment, uh, yikes, in the chat. That's my comment as well, yikes. And thank you, Danny, for sharing all of that information. It's one of those examples where there's just so many things wrong, <laughs> you don't even know where to begin. But part of what beginning is to identify them. I have a, oh, there's several questions in the chat, but I also have a question for Cynthia. I was wondering if you could expand on your analytic for carcerality, like the ways that you locate and are able to see it in practice, um, because we think about detention in different contexts, um, but consent is also an issue. And I'm wondering, do you have like a heterogeneous framework for agency when you say that, um, detainees cannot consent. And I think partially like it, is that informed by how you're understanding the position of citizens and non-citizens or, yeah, where does that come from? Um, so when I, um, when I talk about carcerality and carceral spaces, I'm thinking about carceral geographies as both prisons, but also bordering projects, right? So ICE detention centers are carceral spaces, as I mentioned, both through that it's uh, a prison for, for migrants, um, but it's also an expansion of the US-Mexico border, right? Um, it's where both prisons and borders meet. Uh, so that's how I'm thinking about carcerality. And under carceral conditions, um, feminists, uh, like feminist women of color have argued that people cannot legally consent, right? Or give this idea of consent to the state because carcerality is a coercive state, right? People are being um, detained or incarcerated, held captive against their will to begin with. So everything about the conditions of carcerality produce a state where people cannot legally consent. So that's, that's usually what's argued in terms of women um, incarcerated who have been subject to forced sterilizations. I skipped over some slides, but I, I do talk about forced sterilizations as well, um, both forced sterilizations in prisons and US prisons and also forced steri sterilizations or hysterectomies in ICE detention centers. Because the ways that also um, like the, the prison medical um, medics have been able to get away with this both in ICE detention and US prisons is to say that people gave consent, that that um, people incarcerated gave consent and there's like a document, right? And they produce these documents where they did give consent. So that's the way that this has been going on. Um, however, <laughs> this is the paradox that people cannot consent, right? It, it's argued that because they have no rights under the carceral regime or carceral, when they're in carceral geographies, they don't have that right to have consent. It's not to say that um, folks are not deserving of, you know, a, a perceived personhood, right? Or that folks cannot express themselves sexually. It's just when it comes to state violence, state violence maneuvers and manipulates this idea of agency and consent. Um, I think this is layered with migrants in detention because migrants are not only incarcerated, but migrants are also at the same time non-citizens, right? So it's this, it's this it's this double status where they're captive, but they're also non-citizens. Where we know that people who are non-citizens don't have any rights, don't have habeas corpus, etc. 
Um, I hope <laughs> that answers some of the questions, but that is how I'm thinking through this, right? That it's at this moment where sexual violence gets happens, sexual violence happens, and there's the record of it happening, then consent gets invoked to to justify it and to have you no know, accountability of um, the folks, the perpetrators. And so, so many important things to think about. And I see there's still some questions in the chat, but we are at time. So I propose that we sort of formally sort of close the session, but tonight I'm happy to, to stay on in the Zoom room a little bit longer, um, invite the presenters to also use the chat to directly answer some of those questions. Again, I want to sort of close by sort of again, you know, you know, recognizing the importance of these sorts of presentations of this type of work and also of coming together to talk about this kind of work. You know, scholarship, good scholarship has the, you know, possibility of enacting positive social change, but it has to get out there. Uh, we have to be able to talk about it. So thank you all presenters for allowing me the opportunity to learn from you today. Thank you everybody else uh, for being here, for taking time in a very busy week uh, to engage with this knowledge production. And thank you again to the faculty commons groups uh, and to the Center for Ideas and Society for putting together this conference for us. And as a reminder, there are two additional sessions this afternoon, uh, but we have a bit of a lunch break, which also gives us uh, in this session a bit of flexibility. Uh, the next session starts at 2 p.m. Again, okay. well, that we will formally close, uh, but as I said, I'll stay on just a bit longer.